Thank you. So just over two years ago, I was a recently divorced, middle-aged neuroscience professor at UBC Okanagan. And then I did something that changed my life forever. I swiped right. <laughs> and this is what happened. Now, don't worry, you didn't by accident stumble into the workshop on how to meet your perfect partner online. <laughs> Although if the organizers want, I could come back and do that one next year, because I have learned that. That's my turn. <laughs> so, I was just sitting watching her. And <laughs> so if people had told us two years ago when we met on that online dating site, or even 30 years ago when we started our respective professional careers, what we'd be doing today, we wouldn't believe them. It's true, but we did meet online, and we fell in love. A very tall, slightly geeky neuroscience professor... <laughs> with an expertise in concussion and the executive director of a women's shelter. Not long after we started dating, I stumbled upon this article. It stated a large proportion of women who've been in intimate partner violence situations have also suffered a traumatic brain injury. We know that concussions can lead to all sorts of difficulties with things like headaches and difficulty concentrating and paying attention and nausea. Imagine the impact it would have on your life. Imagine you're playing a pickup game of hockey with your buddies one evening and you fall and you accidentally hit your head on the ice. You struggle to make it back to the bench feeling nauseous and dizzy and you head home that night with a headache and, and fall, have difficulty falling asleep that evening as a result. Maybe you have difficulty falling asleep the next night as well. You might find yourself a couple days later having a challenge just carrying on a conversation with your colleagues or your friends. Or worse yet, you might forget how to get to your daughter's school to pick her up at the end of the day. We've all seen the headlines about the effects of concussions in uh, high-performance athletes like football players and hockey players. Sidney Crosby is the case study on all of this. Many of you also may have seen the movie starring Will Smith in which the devastating effects of repeated concussions in, in professional football players can lead to, uh, potentially lead to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. But how big is this problem, really? Well, let's take a look at the numbers. In Canada, there are about 640,000 amateur hockey players uh, uh, throughout the whole country. That includes kids as young as four or five years of age, as well as old-timers like me. Each year, about 10%, or 64,000, will end up getting a concussion. That's a pretty big number. If we look just at the NHL, there are about 700 players on the combined rosters of all the teams. And each year, about 5% of them, or 35 players, end up getting a concussion. Given these numbers, I think you can appreciate why some people call this a concussion epidemic. But how does it compare to what we see in women who are survivors of intimate partner violence? So there are about 12 million women in Canada between the ages of 20 and 54. So how many of them will experience violence or abuse at the hands of a partner in their lifetime? I'm actually going to ask you guys to help demonstrate that. If you could look under your chair, anyone who finds a sticky note either stuck under your chair or somewhere in the vicinity, please stand up and stay standing. <laughs> All right, now I want you to take a look around. Everybody who's standing up represents someone who will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Statistically speaking, that's one in three of us women. Shocking, right? You can sit down now. <laughs> Thank you, that was excellent. I'll buy you all a glass of wine when we're done. <laughs> so those statistics were women who will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. If we want to talk about annually, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States recently did a survey that showed 2.3% of women will experience a severe violent episode at the hands of a partner every single year. Assuming those same numbers here in Canada, that works out to 276,000 women a year. So how many of them will experience a brain injury? Of the women who seek help at hospital emergency rooms or women's shelters, as many as 90% 
report symptoms consistent with concussion. That translates to 250,000 women in Canada every year. Now to put that in context, for every one NHL player who suffers a concussion playing the sport he loves, 7,000 women suffer the same injury at the hands of the men they love. With athletes, we've got strict protocols about when it's safe to return to play. Take Bob. He gets knocked out in a big game after getting a vicious body check from a, team, a player on the opposing team. After he's helped off the ice by his teammates, he's taken back to the dressing room and he's had, he has his symptoms checked by the uh, medical personnel. If a concussion is diagnosed, he's told to rest until he's fully recovered. In the days or perhaps weeks after the injury, he'll have his symptoms reassessed, and when they fully disappear, he'll be cleared to return to play. So then there's Susan. She's one of the more than 6,000 women and children who find refuge at women's shelters across this country every single night. She and her son Christopher arrive at our shelter at 2 a.m. He's in his PJs, clutching a favorite stuffed toy he managed to grab as they ran out of the house. Susan has her purse, some basic ID, and a black eye, not her first. These last few years, she's had lots of black eyes, many bruises, and has had to live with the kind of ongoing emotional abuse and mental torment that I hope none of us can ever even imagine experiencing. This last time, her husband smashed her head up against the kitchen wall so many times, she pretty much lost count before she finally managed to grab Christopher, run out of the house, because her husband went downstairs to grab another drink from the beer fridge. Now, in the 30 days that Susan and Christopher stay at our shelter, she's expected to accomplish a lot. She has to parent her son. We all know that's a challenge in and of itself. She has to apply for social assistance because she stayed home with Christopher while her husband was the main breadwinner, so she needs an income. Maybe she has to meet with legal aid to try to figure out some custody and support issues. And she has to find safe, affordable housing for them to move into. So imagine she's dealing with this and the fear and trauma and anxiety of having finally left this long-term abusive relationship. What if she's also dealing with the challenges of a traumatic brain injury? I wanted to know why nobody really seemed to be talking about this why scientists like Paul were more interested in the impacts and incidents of concussion in professional athletes than on women, who we all know make up a far larger proportion of the population and are expected to contribute a lot. So together with the grad students working with me in my lab, we scoured the literature to see what work had been done on this topic. And the short answer is not much. There's a small handful of studies which have looked at the incidence or frequency with which Survivors of intimate partner violence have also suffered a traumatic brain injury. And there's some great work out of Harvard looking at brain function in this population, which is showing that they have deficits in terms of memory function and cognitive flexibility, the ability to do one or more things at the same time. In addition, this work is showing that there are changes in the patterns of functional connectivity between different parts of the brain that are consistent with the cognitive deficits that you see in people who have been diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. So clearly, we're really just scratching the surface in terms of this uh, area of research, and there's much work left to be done in terms of the intersection of intimate partner violence on the one hand and traumatic brain injury on the other. So Paul and I decided to combine our expertise and passion and launch a research study. Our hope is to somehow fill a little bit of the knowledge gap. So the objective of the study is to use obje objective measures to better understand the brain dysfunction in this population. Now, one of the challenges with concussion is that there's no clear diagnostic test to determine if it's occurred or not. Typically, physicians rely on subjective reports of symptoms to make their diagnosis and to manage the injury. In addition, uh, when a physician, for example, tries to determine whether someone's broken their bone in, a, in their ankle or their leg, they use an x-ray. It's really obvious to the naked eye, almost. And that's not the case with concussion. You can't visualize that a concussion has occurred. Let me show you what I mean. So these are brain images, structural MRIs, in this case from someone who suffered a stroke, a fairly major brain injury. And you can see the white part on the left side or the left hemisphere of the brain. It's called the hyperintensity, and it's indicative of the damage that occurs in this injury when the blood supply gets cut off to that part of the brain. 
here's a structural MRI of someone who has multiple sclerosis. In this case, the hyperintensities are spread throughout the brain in this slice. And again, it's indicative of the damage that occurs in this case from the uh, demyelinization, which is a hallmark of this disease state. Now here's a structural MRI of someone who's had a concussion. Now, I'm not a neuroradiologist. I don't know if there's any neuroradiologist in the room, but that's a normal-looking brain. And so we l we're left with this disconnect between the subjective symptoms that the person's reporting, the headaches, the nausea, the difficulty concentrating that can make it a challenge to make your way through the day, and our inability to objectively see, or in this case, visualize that an injury has actually occurred. So the research taking place in my lab is designed to fill that gap, as Karen has said, to come up with objective measures of, of a concussion. And we're using a number of different approaches in this project. One is to look at potential physiological changes that underlie the injury. In particular, we look at the blood flow to the brain under different circumstances, and then make inferences from the potential physiological changes that we can see from those changes in blood flow and relate it to the symptoms that the person may be experiencing. Another approach is to use what we call blood biomarkers, so signatures in the blood supply itself that are indicative of the response to the injury. One example of this is inflammation. So we've all sprained our ankle, and quite often the result is you get swelling in the ankle. The same thing can happen in the brain. It's called neuroinflammation. And when neuroinflammation occurs, there's a signal that you can pick up with sensitive analytical tools that will tell you that a, that a brain injury is likely to have happened. So by using these objective approaches in this population, we hope to be able to better understand the potential for brain injury uh, in, in this group. Now, one thing that's important to consider is that, unlike with young athletes, victims of intimate partner violence quite often have emotional disturbances which go along with the abuse, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, and anxiety. And so in addition to the physiological measures and the blood uh, biomarker measures that we'll be doing, we'll also measure these emotional disturbances and then account for them in, uh, statistically in the, our experiments. So other than gathering new data and trying to continue the efforts to come up with a really effective diagnostic tool for concussion, what are we trying to accomplish with this research? The fact is, even though some early work has been done, we still don't have a really good handle on how traumatic brain injury affects women who've experienced intimate partner violence. Shelters like ours don't generally do any kind of assessment or screening for brain injury when we do intake on clients. Staff are not trained in the signs or symptoms of concussion, nor are they trained in how to particularly help women who might have those extra challenges. But if a woman is dealing with those extra challenges and can't accomplish what's required during her stay at a shelter, it's frustrating for her, and it's particularly frustrating for the staff who are working so hard to support her. Contrast this with what happens when someone gets a brain injury, for example, from a car accident or a fall. As soon as the injury is diagnosed, they can access resources and supports in the community to help them in terms of their functional recovery. And that's what we'd like to see happen with victims of intimate partner violence. When we work with women who've experienced violence and abuse, we do it through what we call a trauma-informed lens. How we listen, how we interact, how we move through the counseling process, it's all done within the context of understanding the impacts of trauma. So what if we could add a brain injury-informed informed approach so what if we could add a brain injury-informed approach to the existing trauma-informed approach? That might allow us to change how we do our assessments at shelters like ours to account for the possibility of a brain injury when we do intake on clients. We could create special training for frontline workers so they would know the signs and symptoms of concussion and how to really help women who are experiencing that. Maybe we could get extra dollars from our funders to increase the stays for women who need that extra time and support after they've fled an abusive relationship if they're also experiencing the impacts of a brain injury. We could possibly also get access to better medical and other resources to which we could refer our clients. And then there's the larger societal implications. Each year, Canadians spend around $7.4 billion dealing with the aftermath of intimate partner violence. This can be, take the form of tangible costs like emergency room visits, loss of income, and in some cases, funerals, as well as intangible costs associated with the pain and suffering that typically goes along with the abuse. 
if this project can increase our understanding and awareness of this issue, help places like the women's shelter in terms of policies and procedures, and make even the tiniest dent in the financial and societal costs associated with intimate partner violence, then what we're doing will be worthwhile. So what does it all mean for Susan? And you can give her any name you want, really. As a victim of intimate partner violence, Susan represents so many women. She's the clerk at your local grocery store. That mom that you see at the beach every week playing with her kids. She's your coworker in the office. Your cousin. She's you. She's me. And in the end, she is what this is all about. The fact is, women make up over half the population. And uh, the, the, too many of them are still victims of intimate partner violence. The impact this has on them, their children, and family, and society as a whole is huge. Victims of intimate partner violence need to know that even if they never make the headlines or are a subject of a blockbuster Hollywood film, we're committed to increasing research into the impacts of concussion beyond that which we see in athletes because we know that helping them achieve a healthy life free from abuse is good for all of us. And to think, it all started with a swipe. 